In this video, our goal is to create a new application on back for app and play around with the parse dashboard that back for app will give us for free. So click on this guide to learn how to set up back for app and a parse server. And we're going to scroll down and we're going to deploy parse server with back for app. So tap on this link and I'm already signed in to back for app. If you haven't signed in or signed up yet, then go ahead and do that with either Google or GitHub. Uh, once you've signed in, tap on this button for new app. And then I'll call this application parsedagram Rahul. And then I'll leave the parse version as default. This is the latest stable version. So I'll uh, leave that there and then I'll tap on create. Now this process might take a couple minutes, but basically par back for app is uh, provisioning a server for us, which has the database application layer auto scaling, backup, security, all these features that we don't want to deal with, it'll take care of for us. And once it's ready, um, now we'll land into this dashboard. The, this dashboard is really useful and it's a way to get visibility into your application. So eventually you're going to have many Instagram posts in your application. The way you can see all those posts and the users who have made those posts will all be through this database browser. By default, you should have two entities already existing in your database. One is role and the other is user. So role, we're not going to spend too much time talking about. That basically is a way to define different types of users. So you could, for example, you could imagine having an admin user and a normal user, and that could dictate what they're allowed to see or what they're not allowed to see. User is the actual user entity who's signing into your Instagram clone. And so you can see here that each user has a couple different attributes, object ID, email verified, ACL stands for access control list, which is related to the concept of role. Basically it tells us what permissions or what access this user has. Updated at, auth data, username created at, password and email. So let me show you how easy it is to create a new user. I'm gonna tap add row. And many of these attributes are gonna be filled in for us automatically. The only two that we need to provide are a username and password. So the first user I'm going to create is one representing me. So I'll say username Rahul. And then the password is required. You can see that in the bottom right. And then I'll make the password also Rahul just to make it super easy for us to test. And as soon as I did that, now you can see um, the object ID is created for us. The ACL access control list was created for us, updated at, and so on. A lot of these are already created for us. Um, to make our application a bit more interesting, why don't we add one more row? So I'll tap on this button over here. And let's have one more user for Nathan. So I'm going to have the username be Nathan. And then similarly, I want the password to be identical to the username, just to make this easy for us. So right away, you can see the value of having this parse dashboard because we're able to bootstrap our application with these two users. So eventually we're going to be programmatically creating new users when they sign up in our application. But for now, because uh, we don't want to worry about that initially, we'll create these users who can sign in and we'll also create another entity in our database called a post so that we can create fake posts and really have something interesting to work with in our application without having to do all of the creation flows. One thing I want to point out is that if you go to another section, for example, API console, and then you come back into database browser, then you can see there's another table created called session. And session is basically a way to track whether a user has signed in or not for each user entity. So you don't have to worry too much about it. We don't have to modify this table at all. All you have to know is that the session class is managed for you automatically. And you should see a one-to-one -one correspondence between the number of users and number of sessions, at least initially. So the other main entity other than the user that we're going to care about for our application is something called a post. So I'm going to create a custom class here and then we're going to call this post. And this is going to represent one Instagram post. So I'll create the class here. And our job now is to, in addition to these default columns that have come into this post table, object ID, updated at, created at, and ACL, we're going to create a couple more columns which represent the main attributes for an Instagram post. When I think about an Instagram post, three of the attributes I can think of, which every post must have, are a description, which is a string, uh, a user, an author who made that post, and an image. So let's, let's add those three columns. So tap on this button, add, add a new column. The type of data we want to store for the description is going to be string, so I'll leave that there. And then we'll call this description. 
And then there's no default value, and we do want this to be a required field. So then we'll tap add column. So now you can see up here, there is a new column called description. Let's add one more column, which will be for the image. And there's a special type of, for that called file. And we'll call this image. And there's no default value. And it is technically a required field. It doesn't make sense to have an Instagram post without an image. But for now, I'm going to leave this as not required just because in subsequent videos, as we develop the creation flow for our Instagram post, it'll be easier, it'll be simpler if we leave it as non required, as optional. So we'll change this later, but for now, leave it as optional. And then finally, the last column that we'll want to add is the user or the author who made this post. So our first thought here might be, why don't we embed the username of the author of this post as a type of string into the into the post? And we want this to be required and let's add the column. So this works, but if you go down this route, you're actually gonna run into some issues later on. And the issue is that you can imagine how the username might be Nathan, which is pointing to the fact that Nathan made that particular post. But let's assume that later Nathan changed his username. So now you're gonna have essentially a bunch of stranded posts who have a username of Nathan, but there's no actual corresponding user with that username. So instead, what we, what we really want is a way to associate this column to a user in our user table. We want essentially a foreign key uh, from the post to the user table. So I'm gonna delete the username column because we wanna go about this in a different way. And let's add a new column and instead of having the type of this data be a string, we actually want it to be a pointer. And this pointer, now it gives us an option to have a target class, and the target class will be a user. We'll call this attribute user, and then there's no default value, and it is required. So now, every time that there's a change in the underlying user, because the user pointer is resilient to that, we'll still be fetching the proper user information, regardless of if the username or email or the profile picture eventually of the user has changed. Let's add a sample post for our application. I'll tap on this button, add a row. And I want to create a sample Instagram post made by Nathan, and it'll be a post of his headshot. So his, the description will be my headshot. And then the image, I downloaded this nice headshot of Nathan. I'm going to upload that. And then it, down here, it says the user is required. So in order to associate the post to the user, the way we make that work is you have to paste in the object ID of the user. Uh, I copied it to my clipboard and I'm going to paste it in right here. So the way I found out this object ID is I went back into the user table and here's the row corresponding to the Nathan user. I copied the object ID and that's how I was able to paste it in right here. And you can see that this works because if I tap on this user entity, you can see that it actually navigates me to the user table and I'm just able to see the Nathan user. The last thing I want to show in this video is a section here about API console. So open up the rest console part of this. And this is basically a way to test out querying your database. So we're going to make a get request, which means we're going to retrieve data. And the endpoint is going to be on the users class. So I'm going to fill out classes slash underscore user, which is a pointer to the user table that where we have two users. You can specify some optional query parameters, but for now, I'm just going to leave those as the default. I'm going to tap on send query. And so if you scroll down, now you can see we're getting back JSON data. And there are two results in this results JSON array, one which is for Nathan, and then the other which is for Rahul. These are the two users that we've defined in the users table of our database. And this is how our client, our Android app, will work. We're going to be issuing queries on posts uh, using something quite similar. And you also have the ability to customize this query. So you can see how if I only want to look at users which have a particular username or a particular object ID, I have the power to do that right here. So this is a really useful way to debug your app and play around with the types of queries you can make on your data. So as a review, what we did in this video is we created a new back for app application. We set up the parse dashboard, we put in some fake users, and we put in a fake post, and that fake post actually has a pointer to a user that we created. Um, so we are able to bootstrap our application. 
In the next video, we'll start coding and we're gonna build out the login flow for our application.